engagement. We have a diverse audience today, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to our NATO partners who have dialed in for today's session. My name is Penny Mellis, and I am the director of the Global Cultural Knowledge Network at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. GCKN is part of the TRADOC G2, and we help provide the Army with a holistic understanding of potential current and future operational environments through the collection of expertise and information and the development of product and services to enhance OE understanding. And that's what we are here today to do. Today we have the honor of presenting you with the speaker, Dr. Katra Pinona Nami, an expert in Russian relations who is currently serving as a senior research fellow for the EU's Eastern Neighborhood and Russia Research Program of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. She has graciously devoted her time and expertise to us this morning to discuss with us Russian influence operations. We're extremely grateful for the doctor's participation with us today, for coming here and giving us her professional opinion on Russian influence operation as an expert on the topic. The brief that she presents today is representative of her position and her position only on the matters and are not necessarily the official views or endorsed by the U.S. government or the Department of Army or the TRADOC G2. The doctor has graciously agreed to a question and answer session at the conclusion of her brief. As a reminder, this event is unclassified and uh, we need to keep all questions and discussions at the appropriate level for releasability. We are recording this session today. I've had a couple questions already on access to the slides. We will be posting it and it will be available at a later date. We have not yet identified where the event will be recorded or posted, but we will notify you all via OEE distribution list once we have it posted. Today, um, the doctor is going to present an overview of Russia's strategic deception, the logic, themes, and purposes. Uh, without further ado, doctor, you're ready to go? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for wonderful uh, description of my, my earlier work and I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Especially I would like to thank Tim Thomas for helping to organize this opportunity for me. I should add perhaps at the beginning that um, neither my um, views and the slides presented here do not represent any official Finnish view or any official view of the institutes that I'm affiliated. So I will start as an assistant professor of Russian security policy in, in August and therefore this as a short uh, introduction as well. But let's go to the actual topic. I wanted to start by describing you very briefly um, my usual starting points of analysis, how how I look the the Russia topic in, in general. I really believe that we need to understand the concepts and try to compare their use in different historical periods of Russian history, Soviet history, and because this these uh, assumptions in the conflict situation are informed through the concepts. And it's also important to compare the Soviet Russian and the Western concepts, something that I'm not going to do here today too much, uh, and also taking into account the political system in Russia. And from this background, then we have an opportunity to in understand better the logic of choices available for the Russian decision makers. So this logic and the choices made um, have a sense in, in that framework that is not necessarily obvious for outside observers. And then all of this is really important for being able to defend uh, to create a sensible and smart defense against in, against these intrusions. 
So this is as a very, very brief um, background. You, you can see and hear from how I describe it that it comes from the constructivist viewpoint. Maybe I should also mention here that I'm, my background is in international relations and Russia research. So um, today, I, here's the structure of my presentation. I got some very good uh, questions from you and have tried to organize my presentation accordingly. I hope that I'm able to answer at least partly those, those questions. So before going to the concepts, I think it's important to bit look at the, some general level, some approaches and assumptions of Russia's approach to conflict. I focus on three particular same themes here. There are others, but I think these are important from the perspective of our theme today. Then I'll have uh, some more information on uh, trying to clarify the concepts used. And then I give you some examples of strategic deception. This is, by the way, the uh, sort of uh, military encyclopedia viewpoint to this whole thing. So I use the strategic deception as a, as a general theme based on the Russian military writings. Um, but doesn't mean that every deception operation is at the strategic level. And then I offer some conclusions based on, on the, on the uh, discussion here and my previous work. So, uh, let's go to the first one. Some background assumptions. Um, the Lefebvre here mentioned is, is a theoretician who, who is uh, responsible in a way of the reflexive control theory. But he's also written an um, interesting book in 1977 on differences between uh, moral principles in the Soviet and Western uh, practices. And I think this is Im important as a background for, for the further discussion. Uh, there's the idea in, according to Lefebvre, the Christian ideology is based on the prohibition of evil. The idea that people should um, avoid doing evil and there should be some limits to that. This is not the um, um, background of the uh, Soviet thinking that was consolidated after revolution. Instead, it's based on the declaration of good. All the guidance, guidelines for the Bolshevik uh, good Soviet man were oriented at describing the good and what is the good life, what is the good Soviet man. And there were nothing said about the limits of what should, can be done to achieve this good state. And from there, the Lefebvre then uh, argues that uh, the, the second ethical system that became the backbone of Stalinism uh, was based on the idea that end justifies the means. Now I'm not um, trying to say that the current Soviet, uh, Russian political system would be similar to the Stalinism, but um, there are certain traits that uh, I think make this sort of assumption still valid. The other one comes from different angle and deals with the language use in general. Again, this is not to claim that the uh, uh, current Russian political language is totalitarian. It's only to say that the writings of Hannah Arendt in, in 58 are a very good background for reading uh, the current Russian propaganda theme. And Petr Pomerantsev in his book uh, published in 2014 kind of underlines this or um, kind of clarifies this. The point is that um, this this type of language use is intentionally sabotaging the reasoning and the ability of the public in a way to 
exercise their in individual thinking. And w where it leads to is the, the stylized, ritualistic, but also internally inconsistent repetition of the official line. This was very much what the Soviet um, political speech was. And, and now in the conflict situation where Russia is with Ukraine, uh, there is the same, same kind of phenomenon. Then the third um, observation or background uh, assumption is coming from the, one of the theoreticians, again from, from Russia, but this is a, not analytical, this is more like a presumption that is held by many thinkers writing on information operations, for example. Uh, the, idea of atomization of post-Soviet Russian society, well, that's an uh, analytical um, claim as well. This is what has been observed by many sociologists or political scientists. What is also happening is the idea that there is ongoing a systemic manipulation of public opinion. And uh, this is, has to do with um, this was written in early 2000 when the process kind of got accelerated with the Putin getting rid of the Russian independent news media and, and other political parties. But the, the last line here, the idea that society becomes an easy target for foreign info psychological influence is the opinion held by many many writers in, in Russia on this topic. So the sense of vulnerability for outside influence is very, very um, manifested in, in these writings and often becomes the kind of starting point of, of the discussion. So that's a good to keep, keep in mind. Uh, then, um, then about the geography, geography principle. So, um, was it? Yes. Um, it's different ways to say it, but of course, when we speak of Russia, it's usually, usually mentioned that it's the, one of the biggest, biggest country in the, in the world that has a very difficult political geography or, or economic geography more correctly. Um, with this uh, huge landmass creates the perception of unsecure borders. That is then um, translated into the doctrinal level. I'm here referring to two different concepts. I go into the details in a minute. Uh, what it describes, uh, kind of, there's a sense of um, being threatened being besieged, that is historically, historical pattern of thinking. And it leads to the idea that those countries, there's even a name for these countries that are neighboring Russia, should somehow show their loyalty towards the Russian Kremlin, basically. And here the idea of friendship and the good neighborhood relations work as the ways of intimidation of these uh, leaderships if in these countries. Then there is in the idea of this historical um, authority, authority given by history by the fact that some countries have belonged, like Finland, uh, to be part of the uh, Russian um, Tsardom. So um, I have just as an example two latest um, documents. First, the concept of state policy in the sphere of international development aid that has the perhaps the best uh, example and description of this thinking. The idea that there are these neighbors that have different kind of stages than uh, real foreign countries with which uh, Russia cooperates on the basis of 
national interest and, and equal partnership. The foreign policy concept from last year um, also um, repeats the same ideas. And here is mentioned the formation of good neighborliness relations with the neighboring countries to promote elimination of the existing hotbeds of tension and conflicts in their territories. This uh, uh, text that I uh, is in bold has been changed from the previous one in 2013. It only mentioned the possibility of, of these hotbeds of these conflicts in the territories and the danger it creates for Russian uh, regions in the nearby. But this um, argumentation is now different. It says that Russia uh, thinks it has a right to intervene in this kind of conflicts. So this merely describes perhaps or is an example of how these doctrines are kind of very much live in the present time and are used as a maybe the, as a leg legitimation tool. Um, then there is, uh, of course, the military doctrine that takes a, a bit different view, uh, talks about the troop contingents of foreign trade states near Russian border. This is part of the definition of military danger. And then it, there's mentions of the private military companies uh, somehow being near the border. And this, I believe, is a reference to the conflict in Ukraine. But I he have here at the end of this table an example of how this language is applied. So when the, our president Nienister was at the press conference with the Putin at the Kremlin two years ago, Putin in his speech was uh, using this language from the doctrine, uh, referring to the possibility that, the, that a neighboring state will, will create a, a danger or military threat. For, for Russia. So that only as an as a example of how it is used. Then uh, finally I have a, uh, one of the latest Levada polls uh, showing the idea of hostile and friendly states. Ukraine in this uh, table is an anomaly. It's a, a neighboring country but uh, now described of course in very negative view in in Russia, but in general the idea is that the people, the domestic public is um, kind of trained to think of uh, uh, the neighbors as being friendly and the, then the real foreign countries as, uh, as uh, aggressive or hostile. And this then um, creates the idea what is the most important thing I think in this discussion is the idea that neighboring countries, countries neighboring Russia are not um, sovereign in the strict term, but the sovereignty is conditional to the proximity to Russia. So this kind of idea is expressed in in this doctrinal level and then at the domestic propaganda on disinformation. I still continue with a bit of this background assumptions uh, that we can kind of uh, try to trace here again with the, with the do uh, doctrinal uh, documents. Uh, these documents are interesting also because all of the major foreign and security policy documents have been adjusted after 2014. So National Security Strategy 2015 and one of the latest is the Information Security Doctrine. I think uh, if we compare all of these documents we can say quite confidently that only the ones dealing with the economic policies are devoid of this very harsh 
language so they they are written in a i would say quite normal <coughs> normal way um so what kind of threats are there expressed and what are in a way assumed at the moment i think here at the national security strategy one of the first points to mention is that the the definition of the threat is more vague than the previous one it leaves a lot of room for interpretation in general the scale of threats towards russia is mm, described as increasing like in the information security doctrine uh, military doctrine doesn't mention the nato as a uh, threat but this uh, later version does mention that and the idea of uh, foreign countries alliances uh, containing russia is is present in in this description so these are uh, were meant to be as a uh, some of the starting points some of the assumptions that i wanted to put forward in in this presentation but then uh, let's go to the concepts i try to describe how i see and what are the relations between these uh, major major concepts um, i'm here referring to mahmoud karyev uh, this quotation is from 2008 article where he kind of went through the lessons learned from the five day war with georgia uh, where he kind of advocates an idea that uh, russia must now focus on assimilate asymmetric measures they must be more united and common concept of how to how to do it because of certain military capabilities were found wanting in in that war and then um certain ideas expressed in the article were later found in the national security doctrine uh, or strategy that was published in 2009 but i think this is the approximately um, one of the starting points of thinking differently in russia but um, next i have a, unfortunately this table is only in in russian i i have it in finnish but it doesn't really make a difference here so but i wanted to have it here because i think this derbin's uh table is one of the best descriptions of the russian russian thinking derbin is uh, head of the information security department at the russian uh, academy of military science the department has been uh, established in 2009 and this um table is from an article published just recently at Academy Vajani Nauk and um, there have been argues in the article that there is this continuous there is a great difference between uh, Eastern and Western civilizations and and the competition and struggle is a, has a civilizational aspect to it so I would say that he represents the quite general thinking on on these issues in in russian aspects but um, <clears throat> what is so interesting here in in this art uh, in this table first of all it starts with the idea of geopolitics so all this struggles all the war is about geopolitical gains the geopolitics is the general framework of seeing seeing thing which is again very typical of, for russian thinking then it um makes a difference between political economic and informational spheres of competition and struggle and i'm here referring um to pointing out the two major categories so the uh, the idea of conflict is you have it open and direct declared offensive 
kind of a idea that you have an operation that has an end stage and a beginning. Then there's a concealed or undirect. And here again, the doctrinal level, it's mentioned similarly. So you have direct and undirect threats to Russia's national interest. And this indirect um, can be then deceptive, um, asymmetric, secretive. And it's, it's, there's not used a military, uh, it's a non-military means. There, therefore, there's the idea that this is a struggle for peace, as it was mentioned in the Soviet era thinking. And then you have the different um, categories of, uh, it's even inf uh, mentioned hybrid, uh, soft power, uh, um, not intensive uh, struggle, blockades, sanctions, humanitarian and other means. Then different kind of psychological operations, demonstrative, imitative, disinform disinformation, demonstration of force. Um, so you have all the different forms in, in this one table. And also some kind of understanding of the links between different forms. But um, it, it's don't, instead of going through very uh, closely this table that unfortunately I have, doesn't have in English for you, I tried to do a small uh, kind of clarification of it. And here um, there is the same categorization. So idea of a war as a, that has beginning and the end. And then the continuous struggle for power that is, takes the form of peace that can, according to Durbin, take like uh, centuries. Uh, so the time frame is to totally different here. Um, what is important is that the, on the basis, the theoretical level, I think the reflexive control theory uh, is relevant for the both. But in the target is the difference. So, but let's go back to that later. I would here put the Maskirovka as part of the military policy rather than um, sort of means, information psychological means used in towards the public in general. So I would here do that kind of um, categorization. From the many different um, uh, aspects of information influence, I here uh, mentioned the organizational weapon and the active measures. I think the concept of organizational weapon is very interesting. It's, uh, it can be, it's very Leninist. It's the idea that you have um, in your control a mass of people like Titushki in in Kiev in in uh, or in some of the cities in the eastern Ukraine, and you use criminal networks, different, um, not necessarily legitimate groups, but also legitimate groups. You kind of organize a group that does hostile actions, but is in your control because that's the big difference and the very Leninist idea. I would even put the trolling, the creation of certain virtual communities under this concept. The active measures concept is very well known from the 80s and, the, and, and it kind of has different aspects, the forgeries, disinformation, front organizations uh, that take the, try to um, influence the, the political system in a more legitimate way than the 
the groups used in the framework of this organizational weapon. Maybe this is a bit too, just making simple things too complicated, but I think that might, might help. Then what is the target? Um, do we get it? Yes, so in, in the theory of reflexive control, the basic idea is that the, the two parties in, in the conflict, uh, the target is the decision-making system. So you try to put into an other decision-making system certain algorithms that make your job easier, to make it very, very simple. So here, the, that would be the end target. Whereas in the political warfare that uses the reflexive control theory as a as a kind of theoretical basis, the target is the integrity of political system. So in the other side, left hand side, you the previous form is totally destroyed. That's the target. Whereas here in the political warfare, the target is and the purpose is to maybe they retain the form, but change the content content to capture the state. We can then, um, there might be different uh, um, kind of, well, thinking of the Ukraine after the independence, it was in a way in the hands of the Kremlin to to large, large extent. Um, and then, but uh, events show that didn't really <coughs> control the situation. Um, I think that's, I hope this clarifies the issue or, and at least wouldn't uh, make, make them more uh, complicated. Um, then um, I have some examples. Again, I used the, uh, the kind of a general th theme here, strategic deception, uh, different examples then clarify uh, maybe what, how the concepts that I just described are useful for understanding the logic. So if we start with the, my, most of the examples deal with the conflict in Ukraine. So first point, of course, is to mention that uh, the Kremlin in the in its um, in its uh, project in Ukraine uses and used uh, this information in very systemic way. Um, at the very beginning, the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs of Ukraine uh, of Russia became uh, one of the propaganda tools. So this is uh, from. March, 1st of March, when the Russian uh, special forces already uh, were holding the, the main, main um, government buildings in Crimea, this sort of um, disinformation was spread widely through, uh, through the meat networks to distract. And what's also interesting, of course, is the uh, continuous um, denial of the of the actual facts on the ground, and and also there is a sense of synchronizing the message, but also Russians are not shy of uh, putting forward very contradictory messages. Mm. So this was the first stage. At the same time, uh, later uh, they became very proud of the uh, the operation conducted, conducted, and then uh, this idea of the polite men became even a trade trademark. Um, but then how the things looked like for the Russian public mostly is expressed here in this table. Again, ap apologies for using Russian language here. So the 
red uh, kind of high um, chart is for the use of the uh, word referendum uh, in in the Russian language newspapers published widely. This is a search I did with the help of Indecrum search engine on those dates. And what it says is that the main message for the Russian public was to say that yes, there was a this is the right of the national self determination and there are there is a referendum that is legitimate. And then at that point, the idea of the, the blue line is here about the anti-constitutional state coup in Ukraine. This was much less visible in the, as a theme in the uh, Russian newspapers. Then you had the, the pictures, this first pictures, Yankee Go Home is from the um, exhibition I visited in April in Moscow 2014, so they were very quick to make uh, this kind of exhibition space where to explain for the Russian Moscow public what really happened. But the other one is the Night Wolves, you probably perhaps know very well, the kind of pseudo-criminal celebrity group uh, that was active in Crimea for years before the actual operation and is the head of this the Kirurg, uh, Hirurg uh, at Zaldostan is often seen uh, next to the Putin so he has the legitimacy to to represent in a way the he was the local militia as, as they wanted to see him. He was transported to Crimea just on the date of, uh, of the capture of the Crimean parliament. So um, this, as we know later, this worked very well. Basically the Western newspapers uh, did the job easier for Russians for not um, acknowledging or not being sure that what were, were the, uh, the military men in Crimea. And then for the uh, public, uh, this was represented as a legitimate act. If we look more closely, um, the themes that were used in, in the Crimea and then later in the eastern Ukraine, I think there are three major themes. The first one is the historical mythological one. And I um, use these books in purpose because <coughs> these were published just after the events. So um, March, April 2014, and then later, uh, I think the Dukin book is from 2015. So there is a, uh, in Soviet times, there was a very active production of books and literature on, on the propagandistic one. And now it seems that this has become uh, one of the ways. I'm not saying that is, it is efficient or anything. It's just interesting to have this books as one part of the, your, your propaganda project. So here the idea in the first section, uh, Crimea is ours, Crimea has always belonged to, to Russia. The, this, uh, there is legal terminology, there is comparison to Kosovo or to all an island disputes. Everything what is here in a way said is that Russia have a right for what it is doing. It's not illegal or anything and the rest is wrong with the sanctions, etc. Far more important, I think, in a public sphere, in the Russian domestic uh, discourse, is the second theme, the kind of conspiratological um, theories or the language. A uh, lot of terms of distraction that um, try to describe and 
do describe the Ukrainians in a negative light, uh, West in a negative light. Very, very aggressive language used here. And, and even to this category belongs all these stories about crucified boy or genocide of Russians. And the point, of course, is to arouse tensions, emotions in the public. And this has been very effective as well. Mostly this is oriented, of course, to the domestic audience. Then the one that is both domestic and uh, and uh, foreign is the idea of that there is this Russian world. It's not, um, it's a bit different, it's more vague than the idea of our neighboring countries having different status than, than the rest of the countries in the world. It focuses on the language, orthodoxy, Slavic uh, historical roots. And here the one major theme is that it's been repeated by Putin many times is the idea that Ukraine and Russia are a one nation, that Ukrainians are not a um, real nation or do, do not at least have a sovereign right for the real sovereignty. And um, it's not pushed too far, at least at, at the moment. The Novorossiya project failed, um, but what is sort of, it's more in the level of assumptions that for Russians it is difficult to comprehend that Ukrainians, what has happened there in Ukraine in the last three years, there's a very vivid nationalist movement that is not, they are militant size, but that's not the only, only story. Um, so, and here, especially the ignorance of the Western audience of Ukrainian history and the understanding of the differences in language and in culture and in political culture has sort of helped uh, to create the idea or the myth that uh, Russian speakers are in danger in, in Ukraine. That was one of the major legitimation arguments for, for going to this war. So I think I have here the, what is still missing from this, these are mainly the domestic things. Then there is the idea of Russia being uh, working for the peace, Russia being uh, for peace, as good as the ethical principle says, and the West, West being aggressive. But uh, I'll come back to that later as well. Then um, uh, one example of the EU uh, targeting the EU common policy towards Russia. This example is from, from my own country. And uh, here, Maybe the idea is that to, it can be Finland, it can be some other country, depends on the context. Um, the idea is that uh, the Russian uh, language and the rhetoric tries to show uh, and use the anti-EU <coughs> uh, kind of um, sentiments in that country. And uh, then Finland is here uh, described as a victim and something outside of the EU, not really the decision maker. And this has been very continuous theme and been very vigorously uh, rejected by the Finnish, Finnish side, of course. We've been one of the countries uh, very uh, clearly behind, behind the sanctions. Um, but this this has been done. Um, there's other examples of using the anti-EU forces that already exist and the tensions that exist. I think that's the one of the uh, one of the common uh, features features of Russia's operations or or its logic. So. They are very good at improvising and using the what is available 
in the, the situation itself, not necessarily always trying to create something or, or making too much effort for it. And of course, the EU at the moment is, there are a lot of tensions uh, available. This one is from the, from the EU disinformation review uh, that has been uh, documenting different propaganda uh, sentiments and different uh, attempts for propaganda. This is about uh, Germany. Um, in Finland, it's uh, also the children children issue is is been evident. Um, what we found in our research uh, published 2016 is that uh, most of the themes that I discussed in the previous slides here, most of these historical, mythological, and conspiratological themes are avoided in the sort of um, news reporting. Not necessarily always in the fast reports, but at least in the bigger reports. <coughs> um, so th those are not that effective. But this kind of um, working with the tensions can be quite, quite effective. Um, then some, some conclusions. Um, I must uh, start with the very um, maybe pessimistic view that um, this Russian um, tactic of using unreliability is, is quite effective because it makes uh, dialogue very difficult. And um, when the starting points are so far from each other, it's even quite I wouldn't maybe use the word dialogue always in this context. Although, of course, it is important to engage in discussion and keep contact, but uh, it's, it's nothing that can fix things easily. So uh, to conclude, um, some basic features that I've described, uh, hopefully understandable way. The, the thinking behind is that this is about your political struggle for power. The neighbors are the first uh, kind of target. There are sticks and carrots. Carrots is the discussion about um, uh, good neighborhood relations, offering some lucrative business deals. And then the sticks are these. Um, organization of hostile groups inside the countries and, and other corrupt, corrupting the elites, etc. And I think the primary objective here is to weaken the Western institution, weaken the adversary that West is seen as adversary. Maintenance of, the, of the, those links that support the Kremlin power. And in that sense, the the very, very last target is the survival of the Kremlin. And also the current economic model, which is um, which to have a, uh, that supports the current political system. So in that sense, the modernization talk is, is just, just talk. Um, what the Russians are very good at is to combine the control, simulation, improvisation. And uh, I think often feels that there really are no limits. So that's why I think it's good to maybe do more research on this second ethical principle. Would, would that be more than theoretical um, informative issue? And then the main point in this sense in the current situation is to target the integrity of the political system. That's the way the struggle in the in the framework of peace is is going towards. About the themes, 
I think there are really the common themes and what is interesting is that these themes um, kind of go across the time. So there are a lot of similarities between Soviet um, arguments for peace in the world and the basic assumptions hold in that propagandistic discourse. So here it is again, Russia is for peace, West is aggressive. And the idea is to conceal your own aggression, of course. And then uh, promoting the idea, especially now when the Orthodox Church has been becoming a major figure in the Russian politics, that Russian civilization is something fundamentally at odds with the West. And then in, in a more uh, on the idea of Kremlin survival. So survival of the state is linked with the current political regime. And therefore, any, any uh, sort of uh, political movements uh, um, criticizing or challenging Putin are seen as a fundamental threat. Uh, I would be curious to know how much the conspiratological uh, thinking inside the Kremlin actually drives the policy, but at least on the basis of reading what they write in the documents, <coughs> there's quite a lot of it. Um, then, <laughs> on what these um, propagandistic themes work, mostly emotions, fears inside the uh, Russia, and then fears of conflict uh, outside of Russia. And also, in a way, self-deception, deception, uh, kind of reluctance of the Western uh, politicians to acknowledge that the links with the Russians are not always very helpful. Um, mm, I would say that there's a lot of manipulation, disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theories, but these are maybe in the marginal groups, not to the not to the larger target. And the targets in general, um, depending of course on on the country, but uh, um, since the Russia. Russians uh, maybe are here mirror imaging on their own system. They believe that by uh, working with the highest authorities, you can uh, kind of fix things as it is uh, uh, happening in, in Russia. But in the Western countries, of course, you need to talk to more, more than one person to make decisions. So. Uh, there might be some um, some ideas that they are not uh, not necessarily work, but that's the logic of of the operations. But also, of course, the uh, since the social media is part of this game now, uh, they are opinion leaders. They are the just the common public. The person reading reading the news from the Facebook that is targeted through through this disinformation. Um, so I think that's that's my uh, presentation. I had some literature here. I uh, should have but maybe more of it, but uh, at least at least something here. So thank you for your attention. I'm ready for the questions that you you might have. Thank you, Doctor, for that presentation. That was both informative and insightful. Very well done. Um, group, uh, what I'd like to do now is open this up for some Q&A. And what we'll do is, if we can be um, courteous to one another, we'll take questions uh, via mic one at a time and allow the doctor to respond. And some of you have typed some questions in the text box. And we will try to go back to those and, and read those and allow for an opportunity for an answer to be discussed. So um, anyone have a question via mic? OK. 
Okay, no questions. Um, let me go back and read one of the questions. All right, here's the first one. Doctor, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. P, thank you for the presentation. From the broad activities you describe, from the Russian activities, have you been able to determine the end state in a geopolitical end state the Russians are after? Collapse of the EU, collapse of NATO, reestablishment of Russian influence or control in the near abroad? sustainment of the Putin government from domestic instability. Does all of this activity lead to a defined end state? Or is this just activity to churn and create instability and confusion in the West to enable Russia to exploit opportunities as they become available? I think um, at the moment it's more like the, the la latter possibility. So, um, how to say, um, Russia is, the conflict in Ukraine and the settlement of this conflict in the terms that are favorable for, for Russia is a high priority. At the same time, um, Putin has said uh, several times that uh, Russia wants to, um, it's, uh, how to say, for the future of Russia, the Arctic exploration is, uh, is, is really important. So Russia needs to get to the Arctic energy resources for its future. And these two issues would, in my logic, come together. So to allow the Western, to get the Western investments without which Russia can't do the Arctic stuff, it would be logical for them to uh, get the settlement in, in Ukraine. But for some reason they are not uh, following this kind of logic. Instead they are maybe uh, going a uh, waiting game. Uh, there is a belief that EU is doomed anyway, that the European countries are weak, can't, uh, can't do anything sensible in, in a way, and, and Russia's future is with the East and etc. I think there is a lot of uh, self-deception in this argumentation in Russia's part, but if this is the idea then maybe they are more of more of waiting the EU to unravel helping here and there rather than um, going very uh, directly to that uh, to that goal as such because at least what I've heard in in talking with the with some uh, Russian um, scholars, is that it's not necessarily a good idea for Russia to get rid of the these institutions that bring stability to the Europe. I don't. I hope that I uh, kind of somehow managed to answer your question. I think you did. Thanks. Um, the next question is. Is the civilizational incompatibility theme completely untrue? Not sure about that. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, it's it's not um, uh, un untrue in a way. Um, one of the best uh, descriptions of the this situation is by Jäger Gaidar from 2004. Three, it's in uh, English. The original essays were written in 1994. The book is called State and Evolution. And there the guide are, describes the, the sort, sort of Eastern pattern of state formation, where the main point is that the state captures all the, all the actors, uh, 
inf uh, important for economic development, modernization, and the establishment of, of consolidated institutions. And we, when state takes the whole piece in a way, it it starts to it become chronically uh, incapable of change, whereas in the Western um, civilization, this uh, independ independence of certain major structures uh, is one of the keys for dynamism of development. And this this is very good, I think, analytical way to describe, for example, the current situation in, in, in Russian politics. But the way uh, these uh, theories those who theorize about information war and information operations in, in Russia, they use the, the civilizational story a bit differently. They make it an axiomatic. They take it as, as this is good, this is the gap that exists, um, and that's why we are attacked. So <coughs> it becomes part of the uh, theory or threat perception. It's, uh, it's no longer analytical usage of this term as in, in some other writings. So I think that's important. There's tr truth to it, definitely, but why, why, why it is used in explaining uh, information war in the theoretical level in some Russian publications is, is, it's not analytical. Thank you. The next question, and folks, we're moving up to the one hour mark, so we'll take two more questions. Um, the next question is, how do you characterize the transition and sophistication of Russian Federation influence operations of today as compared to the Soviet active measures of the 1930s through the mid-1980s? OK, uh, very good. Uh, I think here uh, we try to um, draw a map of this in, in the publication that is mentioned in, in the slides. But uh, I think the general idea that how I understand the difference is that in the Soviet times, uh, the International Department of, of Politburo had had its um, very clear ideological framework and very clear um, vertical control of, of the actors. They worked through the communist parties, of course, front organizations, individuals, and had a very systematic use of the foreign press. And that's what every you know very well. Um, today, because the Russian system is different, it, it works more. There is Kremlin. It has a lot of people there who control the uh, interactions. But it's more open for improvisation. There is more, well, that's what I can't know, but I assume that there is more competition between different um, interest groups. It was still in the Soviet times, but, uh, but now it's. And then, um, then the difference between, um, now the difference is in, in language. Of course, RT is kind of parodi parodizing the CNN or other big uh, companies. So Russians actually imitate a lot of what's done in the West that was may maybe not the case in the earlier times. What I don't know exactly is the uh, scale or the proportion of use of, of uh, FSB or the special services versus the civilian component. Thank you. The next question is, what differences do you see on how Finland consumes Russian propaganda versus the United States? 
Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think it has to, well, obviously it has to do with the historical background. Um, we are very, um, how to say, um, certain kind of themes don't work on, on Finns at all. Um, whereas, and there's certain level of um, knowledge on, on Russian general affairs that might be one way to get us uh, not to believe certain things. But I think here the, each country has its specific codes and they are targeted with specific type of information. So um, it, the answer lies in the historical experiences. But I can't be more specific. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, we'll do the last two questions I see here, question six and question seven. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. P, can you elaborate more on the fourth political theory and the it introduction to the new Eurasianism by Alexander Dugan, and to what extent the Putin administration embraces those ideas? Well, um, I must confess that I don't know very deeply Dugin's uh, latest uh, works. Um, but what I've seen is a very conspiratological, uh, not very good at actually theor theorizing. So I would say that certain elements of this conspiratological discourse uh, have a simi similarity with the Kremlin language. But Dukin got fired from the university and uh, he's still uh, influential in the framework of Izborsky Club and there are some other figures there. Uh, but I would say that he's more marginal than, than we think. More important are these tendencies of believing to this uh, pseudoscientific theories than, than the actual man. He f um, wrote his memoirs of my war in Ukraine that is a very detailed description of his views and ideas and that would be uh, worth to look at. Um, I haven't had time to read it yet but uh, might be a good idea to do that. Very interesting, thank you. And the final question today is, um, doc, whoop, it just, uh, Dr. P, outside of the United States and Canada, what do you see as Russia's objectives in the Western Hemisphere? Um, I th you are now uh, referring to the S South American states and, and, and general this direction, I assume, I think here the the general framework is to think of in terms of Russia, India, China, Brazil, creating something alternative for for the for the Western order, and I think this was very much in fashion earlier when the economic situation looked better. Now it's, um, I, I don't see any, any of that discourse uh, with any meaningful way. There's more about the China relations. But in, in these areas, maybe the idea is to, there's always, what I haven't mentioned enough is that the Kremlin is interested of business deals that are, are favorable for the insiders. So if there are some good deals to do for, for Russian state-owned companies, then, then that can be. And then the politics is there just to make sure that they get what they, they want. So there is not necessarily any grand plan in, in that sense, but it's more like dynamism inside the Kremlin and, uh, and uh, inside these companies. 
Very good. Everyone, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us today for this, this presentation. I think this was an outstanding presentation with valuable information. Um, Dr. P has graciously agreed to be one of GCKN's SMEs. And what does that mean? She's part of our um, connection with outside expertise that we're trying to bring into the TRADOC G2 in the Army. If you have additional questions for the doctor, please send them to GCKN, uh, and we will get them to her, and we'll see if we can get some answers back for you. Um, again, thanks, everyone, for the great participation, the great questions. And um, doctor, thank you for a wonderful presentation. That, thank you very much for organizing this. This was a very excellent opportunity for, for me as well. So, um, And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, trying to answer all of that later as well. So thank you so much. Outstanding. Thank you again. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>